Hi folks, thanks for joining us today for an exciting announcement on industrial energy efficiency and carbon capture utilization and storage. We're going to kick things off with uh, Alvin Hubert who's going to be joining us over video. Go ahead, Alvin. Um, thank you, Harrison, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's kind of cold up here, so I want to tell you I'm thankful for Advantages Energy today as well as uh, their toques. Um, my name is Alvin Hubert. I'm uh, Reeve of Saddle Hills County, and on behalf of our county, I'd like to welcome you all here to today's announcement. Joining us today are the Honorable Premier Jason Kenney, Jason Nixon, Minister of Environment and Parks, Travis Taves, Minister of Finance and the MLA for Grand Prairie Wapiti, Michael Belenke, President and CEO of Advantage Energy, and President and CEO of Entropy Incorporated. Rick Brower, Chief Technology Officer at Entropy, David Barva, Executive Vice President at Tidewater Midstream, and Simon Younger, Vice Senior Vice President of Upstream at Imperial. I'm joining you remotely today from Advantage Energy's groundbreaking ceremony here at the Glacier Glass Gas Plant. I'll leave it to our expert speakers to tell you more about what's happening at the Glacier facility today, but before I pass things over to you, I want to say that it's a real pleasure to see more investment in innovation and technology in our region. In addition to our county's diverse agricultural community, we're located at the center of the Montney Play, one of the largest gas reserves in the world. This means that oil and the oil and gas industry continues to play an important role in our region and helps to create a progressive and growing economic base. This area is brimming with opportunity for a number of reasons, from forestry and petrochemicals to those engaged in the new hydrocarbon economy. And we're excited to see projects like Advantage Energies coming to life here. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the Honorable Premier, Jason Kenney, to, to make today's announcement. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Alvin. It looks like uh, we're a lot warmer than you are out there this morning. Uh, great to uh, be joining you on a snowy Alberta morning for an important announcement uh, that, will, uh, that is about creating jobs while supporting industry and reducing emissions. Earlier this month, Alberta's government announced uh, up to $176 million from the Technology Innovation and Emissions Reduction Program, that's the TIER program, funding for shovel-ready projects that will cut almost 7 million tons of emissions by the year 2030. I said then that we uh, were far from finished and that Alberta will continue to invest in projects that create jobs and reduce real measurable emissions. That's why I am excited to announce today more emissions reduction projects. Around the world, a growing number of companies are investing in carbon capture utilization and storage technology, known as CCUS, plus other industrial energy efficiency opportunities. And Alberta has been a real leader uh, for well over a decade uh, in, in setting the pace for so much of the rest of the world. These are proven technologies that work and that are being utilized, uh, as I say, across Canada and across the globe. One of the main ways that we're supporting these types of investments is through the TIER Fund. And that's something we ran on in the last election campaign in our platform. Last year, we announced up to $750 million from the TIER Fund for programs that cut emissions, keep industry competitive, and create jobs. So today, I am really happy to announce that up to $131 million from the TIER Fund will be used to support uh, industrial energy efficiency and CCUS projects across the province. This is another huge investment that will also reduce emissions while spurring economic growth and job creation. We're using $100 million to support seven exciting projects, some of which are already underway, and we'll be reaching out to other applicants to invest another $31 million in the coming weeks. These seven successful projects we've selected so far are game changers for cutting emissions in Alberta. They'll lead to real-world improvements, like upgrading engines at a natural gas facility to reduce fuel use and cut emissions, and converting wasted heat from uh, generators into emissions-free technology at a gas plant. Uh, they are all incredible initiatives based on homegrown Alberta ingenuity and leading-edge technology. 
For example, as uh, Reeve Hubert mentioned, today marks the groundbreaking ceremony for Advantage Energy at its glacier plant in Brazos County. Advantage is uh, constructing and installing a state-of-the-art carbon capture and storage project supported in part by tier funding. Phase one of this project will cut around 36,000 tons of emissions each year and improve the plant's emissions intensity by 22%. Michael and Rick will have more to say about the technical side of this project in a few moments. Another project we're excited about is Tidewater's mid, excuse me, Tidewater Midstream's fully integrated blue hydrogen plant, which will be the first of its kind in the province. Tidewater will use tier funding for a CCS hydrogen production unit that converts methane to hydrogen, and the resulting emissions will be captured and sequestered underground. The plant will also introduce a 15 megawatt turbine with heat recovery steam generation. Excess steam will be used to offset natural gas consumption from the plant's boilers. Overall, this project will cut about 31,000 tons of emissions each year. Our friends at Imperial plan to use tier funding to help install five more units across the Coral Oil Sands Mine facility to recover waste heat that would otherwise go into the atmosphere. This will reduce heat loss by up to 50% in those bitter Alberta winter months and cut about 190,000 tons of emissions each year. This tech will also recover and reuse up to 700,000 cubic meters of condensed water per year. To give you an idea of how much water that is, it's equivalent to about 280 Olympic swimming pools. We'll hear more about these great projects from David and Simon in a minute. But in addition to these projects, I'd also like to congratulate New Vista Energy, Ember Resources, Strathcona Resources, and TC Energy for their projects that are receiving funding through this announcement. These seven projects will support 2,200 jobs and cut almost 3 million tons of emissions by 2030, the same as taking about 70,000 cars off the road every year. And this program isn't the first time we've seen exceptional leadership from industry when it comes to uh, this kind of technology. Back in March, I took part in Enhanced Energy's milestone event to celebrate the company uh, preventing a million tons, one million tons of emissions from entering the atmosphere in less than a year through, the, through their carbon capture utilization storage project. This project captures carbon in Alberta's industrial heartland, that area just east of Edmonton, transports it through uh, Wolf Midstream's Alberta carbon trunk line to a mature oil field near the town of Clive around Lacombe. There it's used to produce some of the lowest cost, lowest carbon energy on the planet. I'd also like to draw attention to Alberta's imp impressive Quest project, which is really where we began CCUS leadership many years ago under the Stelmac government. They've captured and stored more than 5 million tons of CO2 since 2015. Between the Alberta carbon trunk line and the Quest projects, Alberta's committed more than $1.2 billion funded by industry to promising CCUS efforts and attracted interest from both private companies and governments around the world. And let me just pause there to say this is a great start but it's why we need the Government of Canada to come to the table in a big way. Something that I uh, discussed briefly with uh, Finance Minister uh, Christia Freeland uh, in Edmonton on uh, Monday. Uh, we appreciate the federal government's commitment in principle to an investment tax credit for CCUS, but we need to see a real scale of ambition behind that. Uh, we need to see a refundable credit that is stackable that uh, applies to enhanced oil recovery and that matches uh, the 45Q incentive in the United States if this is going to make a game-changing difference in collaboration with the oil sands producers through their Pathways Initiative. So Alberta is proud to be, to be among global leaders unlocking the next generation of energy production. As a member of the Global CCS Institute, we're part of a network that provides access to reports and discussions on the global status of carbon capture projects and policy. This work, plus our amazing uh, geology, and in fact, Boston Consulting Group says we have the second best geological formation for carbon sequestration, plus our incredible culture of science and innovation, all of these things give Alberta a unique edge. As I mentioned, uh, the Boston Consulting Group has identified us as a real uh, world leader, and, and that's one of the reasons why we see a growing number of petrochemical and hydrogen uh, investments in this province that together will create tens of thousands of jobs. 
So this bodes well for Alberta's broader work to prepare for a lower emissions future, including our progress on clean hydrogen. With the global market estimated to be worth $2.5 trillion a year by 2050, hydrogen could be Alberta's next great energy venture, with our province ready to lead, take a leading position in uh, this growing clean energy industry. But CCUS infrastructure needs to be in place to facilitate cost-effective, large-scale production in this area. And demonstration projects, research and innovation are necessary to prove and scale up emerging uh, hydrogen technology. We're setting a strong foundation, due in large part to companies like those we're highlighting and who are participating today. They are showing, in turn, great leadership on economic diversification uh, and uh, job creation through high-tech high -tech emissions reduction. These projects are more examples of the innovation and entrepreneurship we see from industries every, every day, driving significant environmental results while strengthening and diversifying Alberta's economy when our province needs it most. So I'm really excited about today's uh, announcement, and we'll hear more details from Minister Nixon in just a moment. Well, thank you, Premier. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. This is a big day for Alberta as we take another step forward to create jobs, meet our environmental obligations, and move our energy industry forward. The Industrial Energy Efficiency and CCUS program funding that Alberta's government is announcing today is part of our ongoing leadership to move Alberta forward through innovation and cutting-edge technology. This funding is part of last year's announcement of up to $750 million from the Technology, Innovation, and Emissions Reduction Program. TIER is cutting 6 million tons of emission each year, supporting up to 8,700 jobs and ejecting $1.9 billion into Alberta's economy. The TIER system is a key driver in Alberta's recovery, supporting investment in innovative technologies that cuts emissions, keeps industry competitive, attracts investment, and gets Albertans back to work at a time when they need it most. While others are talking and making empty pledges, we are stepping up and getting to work in the province of Alberta. We see many recent examples of tier funding in action, from our shovel-ready announcement earlier this month to yesterday's $50 million tier announcement with Alberta Innovates. In that announcement, Alberta's government announced that a combined total of nearly $50 million from the tier fund is supporting 23 Alberta projects to advance innovation that will maximize value while providing cleaner hydrocarbons. This will help position Alberta as an even stronger leader in energy technologies and continue to move our world, move our world-class industry forward. Alberta Innovates expects these projects will support about 1,300 jobs and contribute 169 million to Alberta's GDP. Which brings us here today. We're pleased to build on that tier announcement and those tier investments with even more uh, projects, seven industrial energy efficiencies and carbon capture utilization projects that will support 2,200 jobs and cut almost 3 million tons of emissions by 2030. Alberta is a proven leader when it comes to emission reduction technology, from exploring clean hydrogen and geothermal development to government's latest investment in clean tech, industrial energy efficiency, and carbon capture utilization and storage. I'm so impressed by the continued leadership of our industries, seeking out opportunities like the Industrial Energy Efficiency CCUS program to turn their innovative ideas into real projects with tangible, measurable results. The projects we're announcing today are prime demonstrations of Alberta's entrepreneurial spirit. When there is a problem to solve, Albertans and Alberta businesses are quick to find solutions and new ways of doing things. And propelling CCUS and other technology forward are no exceptions. Continuing improvements and emission reductions are proof that we can get the job done no matter the challenges. And the $130 million in funding we're announcing today shows that our government continues to step up and move Alberta forward. Alberta's government will keep investing in practical and effective approaches that benefit both the environment and the economy. Together with industry, we will add to the growing momentum to diversify Alberta's energy mix while cutting emissions. Congratulations to all of the funding recipients, and thank you. You're not only cutting emissions, you're creating jobs in Alberta's oil and gas industry to protect our resources, our province, for generations to come. Hats off to you for your great work that you're doing and the great work that is left to be done. I look forward to watching these projects get off the ground and to announcing even more groundbreaking projects in the very near future. Thank you again. And with that, I'd like to invite my friend, the Minister of Finance and the local MLA for many of these projects, Minister Taves, to the podium.
Well, well, thank you, Minister Nixon. It's really a pleasure to be part of uh, this announcement here today. As Minister Nixon outlined, uh, CCUS technology represents an exciting opportunity for Alberta to reduce emissions while encouraging economic development. Alberta's oil industry is the most ethical and climate focused in the world and today's announcement is another example of the steps we're taking to further investment in, uh, to further investment in technology and innovation in the province's energy industry. In spite of the narrative we sometimes hear, Alberta's energy sector has a bright future ahead, a productive, high-tech, low-emissions future. Alberta oil sands are reaching and surpassing the very highest ESG standards at a level that many of our competitors will never attain. In fact, we're already at the forefront of investment in emissions, reducing investments from major companies, becoming a hub for continuous improvement and innovation in clean, responsible energy production. I think of recent announcements by Dow Chemical, who announced a multi-billion dollar plan to build the world's first net zero carbon emissions ethylene cracker right here in the heartland. Air Products, who announced a multi-billion dollar plan to build a landmark new net zero hydrogen energy complex. And Northern Petrochemical Corporation, who announced a carbon neutral ammonia and methanol production facility set to be the anchor tenant in the Greenview Industrial Gateway south of Grand Prairie. These are only a few of the many investment announcements that we've recently seen in the province. Carbon capture and storage investments are further examples of how Alberta's energy industry is leading the way on the global stage. In fact, an independent study by the Boston Consulting Group identified Alberta and Canada among the highest potential CCUS regions in the world. We share the industry's vision for making CCUS and other emissions reduction technology bigger and better in the coming years, which is why we continue to invest in the tier fund and, pardon me, invest the tier fund into opportunities like the Industrial Energy Efficiency CCUS program that we're here to talk about today. CCUS not only plays a role in reducing emissions from existing industries, it also plays a key part of producing clean hydrogen, which offers a solution to lower emissions in many sectors that are difficult to decarbonize, like chemical manufacturing and heavy duty transport. And Alberta is charting a promising future for the province's energy economy with the recent release of our hydrogen roadmap. This outlines the opportunity for government, industry, municipalities and other partners to advance Alberta's hydrogen sector and position the province as a hydrogen superpower worldwide. With a global market estimated to be worth 2.5 trillion by the year 2050, hydrogen could be Alberta's next great energy venture. Clean hydrogen represents an enormous opportunity for our province to diversify the energy sector while leveraging our existing strengths in natural gas, renewable electricity, and of course CCUS. It's for these reasons that I'm pleased to see Tidewater Midstream's hydrogen project included in the successful projects we're announcing today. These projects represent innovation in action, showing that Alberta's industries are big picture thinkers when it comes to the environment and the economy. Also among these forward-looking companies are Nubista Energy and Advantage Oil and Gas, who are doing great things in northwestern Alberta. I'd like to turn things over to Advantage's President and COO, Michael Belenke, to tell us more about their technology and today's exciting groundbreaking event. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Tabes, and thank you to uh, the Premier for having us today, as well as uh, Minister Nixon. I'm pleased to be here today on um, behalf of Advantage Energy to celebrate breaking ground at the Carbon Capture Project of Glacier, generously supported by Alberta's IEEE CCUS grant program. The project is designed to capture almost 200,000 tonnes per annum of CO2 before it enters the atmosphere, and then store it several kilometres underground. The first phase will be expected to be operating within five months, so this is under construction as of today. Um, 
We see this in the broader context, however, as the first step in providing scalable, reliable, emissions-free energy for the world. The patent-pending technology owned by Advantage's subsidiary Entropy was made in Canada. The equipment is primarily fabricated in Alberta and in Canada. And the engineering, procurement, and construction is being executed and managed by Calgary-based ABC Engineering. It's the first commercial project of its kind in the world. Capturing and storing emissions from engines that are fueled by clean, burning natural gas. But technology is also suitable for hydrogen production. It's also suitable for boilers, gas turbines, coal combustion, cement production, biofuels, and so on. In addition to the support of the Alberta government, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of several distinct groups to make this possible. Thanks to the Advantage Energy team for your efforts to make this project a reality and for constantly looking for ways to get even better at providing clean, reliable energy for the world. Thanks to the Entropy team for your willingness to step into the lead in post-combustion CCS and driving the technology from pilot to commercial reality. Thanks to the University of Regina, and in particular, Dr. Raphael Adem and Dr. Patun Tantawashwithakul for their advisory support and for really driving the state of the art in CCS technology as we make CCS commonplace around the world. And thanks to the teams in the field who are responsible for constructing and operating the project safely and efficiently. As always, safety comes first. So with that in mind, I'm proud to announce that Advantage Energy is now targeting net zero scope one and two emissions as early as 2025, four years in the future. The Glacier CCS project is just the start. We're currently working to develop additional third-party CCS projects through Entropy, which will in aggregate capture and store more CO2 than Advantage emits corporately. Success in achieving net zero on this timeline is predicated on functional CCS regulatory environments and frameworks at both the federal and provincial levels. Fortunately, the existing framework in Alberta is ready today and we hope that the rest of the country and other countries follow quickly. Now I'd like to pass the virtual microphone to Entropy's Chief Technology Officer, Rick Bauer, in the field, uh, actually in Victoria, I think, who played a critical role in commercializing Entropy's technology. Rick, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rick Bauer, as I said, and I'm the Chief Technical Officer of Entropy and also a partner at Allard X Bauer Consulting ABC. And so on behalf of Entropy, I want to thank again the Government of Alberta for their participation in partially funding the Phase 1 carbon capture system at the Glacier Gas Processing Facility. As Mike's already said, this is the first of its kind commercial installation designed to capture post uh, carbon dioxide post-combustion from a large horsepower reciprocating engine. And it's based on a modular solvent capture system and these same modules can be utilized in phase two to capture the emissions from the whole facility. And again, this technology is not just limited to gas engines, but it can be extrapolated to any carbon dioxide emission source, like power generation, cement, steel manufacturing, and all forms of coal combustion. Now, after we capture the CO2, it's gonna be sequestered in a deep secure formation with the required geology to store that captured CO2. And due to the physical properties and the benign nature of the CO2, there's countless formations throughout the world that are capable of storage. So this is a first major step in affecting climate change is we can effectively eliminate the large emissions from any stationary fuel burning source and allow the world to transition to a low carbon future while still utilizing the infrastructure we've already got. So thanks again to the government of Alberta I'm very proud to be part of this project. And I mean, you've heard the words game changer already a couple of times today, and I honestly feel this is a game changer. And then one day my grandkids are gonna be able to say, Grandpa Rick worked on this project, which helped change things. So from that, I wanna pass the mic on to David Barva, who's the Executive Vice President of Tidewater Midstream. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> and thank you to Premier Kenny, Minister Nixon, Minister Taves, and the Government of Alberta for the opportunity to announce Tidewater Midstream's receipt of funding under the program that was just announced. 
This funding is intended to be used by Tidewater to build Alberta's first fully integrated blue hydrogen facility. Tidewater is grateful to the Government of Alberta for this funding and for its support of this project. This blue hydrogen facility is intended to be located at Tidewater's Brazo River Complex, which is a natural gas processing facility situated near Drayton Valley. And thank you to the Tidewater team for your innovation and for your dedication in advancing projects such as this one. This proposed project will help to reduce emissions of specified gases through increased energy efficiency and the production of a low carbon energy source. There are three primary components to this project. A steam methane reformer, carbon capture and sequestration process, and a power cogeneration facility with heat recovery steam generation. The steam methane reformer will convert methane from the natural gas feedstock to hydrogen with carbon dioxide as a byproduct. The resulting hydrogen will be blended into the fuel gas used to power the plant's turbines. Tidewater is exploring market opportunities for any residual hydrogen, produced hydrogen, which may include sale as a commodity, as fuel for industry, and for production of electricity. The carbon dioxide byproduct from the steam methane reformer will then be compressed and injected underground for permanent sequestration. The coal generation facility effectively produces power using waste heat to offset the existing boilers, thereby improving energy efficiency of the Brazo River complex. Through these processes, Tidewater Midstream expects to reduce annual emissions at the BRC by approximately 31,000 tons of CO2 per year. Tidewater is grateful for this opportunity to be part of the government's initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to increase competitiveness by improving facility efficiency. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Simon Younger, Senior Vice President of Upstream Imperial Oil Limited. Thanks very much, David. Premier Kenny, Minister Taves, Minister Nixon, thank you very much for having us here and good morning, everybody. It's really my pleasure to be here and be part of this announcement this morning. On behalf of Imperial Oil, I wish to acknowledge and thank the Government of Alberta for your unwavering support of our industry and for supporting investment in technology to reduce emissions. Imperial recognises the challenge of addressing climate change requires collaboration on an unprecedented scale. Collaboration across both government and industry, like what we are doing with the Oil Sands Pathways to Net Zero Alliance. And we are committed to accelerating innovation and developing new technologies that will deliver industry-leading greenhouse gas and economic outcomes. Imperial has a long commitment to research and development, including more than $2.2 billion invested in uh, R&D over the past 20 years. Now, we greatly appreciate the support from the Government of Alberta through the tier funding to advance our boiler flue gas technology at our Curl oil sands facility as we continue to take steps to reduce emissions. This technology recovers waste heat to reduce emissions, but to give you a bit more background, our oil sands operation uses natural gas to create steam to heat process water. This new technology recovers waste heat from a boiler's combustion exhaust and uses it to preheat process water, resulting in less steam usage and lower emissions. Not dissimilar to a high efficiency furnace and a hot water system that you might find in your basement, only at about 30,000 times the scale. <laughs> Curl was the first in Alberta's oil sands to attempt the full scale field demonstration of this boiler flue gas technology. This also included collaboration between Foresight Cleantech Accelerator Centre, Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, or COSEA, and Alberta Innovates. The first unit was installed in 2020, 
And earlier this year, we achieved successful startup. And I might add, thanks for the funding that we, that we received as part of this program to help get that pilot off the ground. And now we're progressing plans to apply this innovative technology on up to five additional boilers. And the funding announced today will help advance those plans enormously. These installations have the potential to reduce emissions by about 200,000 tonnes per year, which is equivalent to taking nearly 40,000 cars off the road. We are confident the support will translate into meaningful and actionable greenhouse gas reductions at our curl operation and possibly have other applications across industry. We look forward to continued collaboration with the Government of Alberta as we move our industry forward with investments in technology. Thank you very much, and I'll t now turn things back to Harrison. Thanks, Simon. This concludes the formal portion of today's announcement, and we're now going to open the floor to a media Q&A. Uh, as we have no one joining us in person, uh, we're going to flip over to the phones. Uh, and just a reminder to our callers to please uh, direct who your question is going to. Uh, with that, operator, can you please connect our first caller? Chris Barco, Calgary Herald. Hi, this is a question for the Premier. Premier, you talked about uh, having discussions with the Deputy Prime Minister yesterday, uh, including about the CCUS tax credit. Have you made any progress or do you see any progress being made on your request for enhanced oil recovery to be included in that uh, tax credit? And uh, where do you stand in terms of your broader request for, I believe it's $32 billion in potential incentives for CCUS over the span of a decade? Thanks, Chris. It was just a brief uh, aside conversation with the Deputy Prime Minister following the uh, child care announcement on Monday here in Edmonton. And uh, she uh, told me she was going on in the afternoon to meet with representatives of senior representatives of the members of the uh, Pathways Initiative uh, and uh, underscored her, her focus on this issue. I think it was uh, thanks to Minister Freeland's uh, personal initiative that the CCUS commitment uh, found its way into Budget 2021. And uh, I know that she has been, uh, she and her office have been working, uh, as well as her deputy, uh, Minister Michael Sabia, have been working uh, with uh, the industry and in constant uh, discussions with our government. So uh, I don't have any uh, line of sight into uh, what they intend to do. I did raise, however, that there is uh, legislation apparently that has a majority support uh, in the American Congress substantially to increase the generosity of the 45Q uh, investment tax credit for uh, CCUS. Uh, my understanding is that it would take the uh, level of support uh, from roughly $50 a ton to $80 a ton. May, I may be slightly off on the numbers, but it's a step, a significant step up in the generosity of the uh, 45Q uh, in the United States. So my message to the minister uh, and our, our constant message to the federal government is that if we allow the Americans to maintain incentives which are far uh, uh, bigger than, than Canada's, we will see capital flight from here to the U.S. because many of these, of course, are, are multinational companies that have um, U.S. operations. And if they can um, significantly reduce uh, their direct cost, of uh, CCUS and reduce their emissions profile by moving that capital to the United States for projects like that, we, it would really harm Canada's efforts to reduce emissions uh, significantly. So I, I, she didn't give me any, any details about the state of thinking, but did underscore uh, her own uh, very strong per, per personal commitment to this technology. Um, and we certainly want to work with uh, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Government of Canada to advance that. And Chris, do you have a follow-up today? Yes, I do. Um, the COP26 conference is now wrapped up, and I'm wondering whether you've had any further discussions or interactions with members of the uh, federal government on the emissions cap for the oil patch. Uh, do you believe you have more details now to understand it? And more generally, where do you see relations going with the federal government as it relates to energy policy and climate policy? Well, I, I'll, I'll ask Minister Nixon in a second to hear if he's uh, heard from his federal, min federal counterpart on this, but uh, I, I'm not aware. Of any more information, it seems to have been a improvised talking point for the Glasgow audience. Maybe that's why there was no consultation with the province that owns the third largest uh, reserves of oil on the face of the earth. Uh, maybe that's why they didn't bother to pick up the phone and speak to the province that actually regulates the production of that resource. Um, that's my only explanation. I did say to the Prime Minister when I was with him on, on Monday, I, I, I regretted that we didn't have 
Uh, he hadn't uh, given us the opportunity to schedule a meeting on Monday that we needed to meet urgently about these issues. Um, and um, uh, either we'll be taking a group of ministers down to Ottawa shortly or inviting federal ministers to come to Alberta uh, to get in a room and talk through these issues uh, because uh, our message for Ottawa is absolutely clear. If you want to have a snowball's chance in hell of, media, of coming close to these increasingly ambitious targets, you have to cooperate with the uh, government and the people who own and develop uh, Canada's lar uh, the, the world's third largest oil reserves. Uh, we are not an afterthought, and uh, this is not like this is not a conventional political back and forth issue. The the law of the highest law of the land, the Constitution of Canada, says that we own those resources, and we get exclusively uh, to control their production. Section 92A, Constitution Act 1982, black on white. This is not a subject for debate. And so uh, if, uh, if they, they, they want policy that, that constrains the development of our resources under our constitutional authority, they have to deal with Alberta. And you can see here today, and with the tier announcement uh, two weeks ago, um, just how serious this province is about meeting the environmental challenge, about reducing emissions. So our, our uh, hand is outstretched uh, for a collaborative approach. And I'll ask uh, Minister Nixon if he's heard from his counterpart. Uh, thank you for that, Premier. Uh, Chris, no, we have not had uh, conversations with the Federal Environment Minister yet. Having said that, there is a bilat between him and myself this afternoon, uh, and we will be expressing uh, the same concerns that the Premier uh, has expressed uh, with his federal counterpart and other colleagues of mine have with theirs. And that is the fact that we have not been consulted at all on what was said in Glasgow. Uh, at this point, it appears, as the Premier said, to just have been a talking point. Uh, there's nothing that has been uh, sent over to the Alberta government uh, around uh, what was said in Glasgow, uh, and we, we, we frankly don't know what the Federal Environment Minister is up to. I will say, at, at this afternoon, my focus will be on educating the Minister on what is actually taking place in Alberta. He has uh, said some outrageous uh, things, particularly in Glasgow, uh, about uh, what our oil and gas industry in particular is doing when it comes to uh, climate change and the management of GHG emissions. And so we'll be taking some time this afternoon to make sure he understands that we have a world-class industry here that is leading the way. Uh, and we're focused on real results inside the province of Alberta. We want the Alberta government uh, to meet that ambition of real results. Uh, and uh, Sorry, I should say the federal government to meet that ambition of real results and to stop going around and setting targets. The federal government has not met one target in decades on this issue. Uh, instead, we would like to see the federal minister uh, and his department get to the table uh, and support Alberta in getting real results uh, to be able to make sure that we can protect our economy while meeting our environmental obligations. Thank you, Minister. Operator, can you please connect our next call? Dylan Skolski, CTV. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. It's a question for the Premier and perhaps the Environment Minister. Um, Premier, as you mentioned, this is the first time Alberta has looked at carbon capture and storage before. In 2008, billions were spent on the experiments, but several companies actually pulled out over time through the high cost involved. And even the then Auditor General concluded that this would not solve Alberta's emissions problems, and it was deemed a failure by many. I guess what's changed to prove that this is a viable and cost-effective solution? You know, yeah, sure. I think there was a lot of that criticism several years ago. Um, and the, like any early stage technology, it was not initially commercially viable and the costs were, uh, some would argue, prohibitively high. But Alberta, frankly, took a wager uh, in partnership with, with Shell uh, uh, on the Quest project, uh, just as Saskatchewan did with the uh, Estevan uh, Sask Power uh, pilot. And uh, those investment decisions were made um, nearly 15 years ago. The technology has, has now been in use with improvements and, and, and refinements, and we've now seen the, the cost per tonne of sequestration through CCUS technology come down on average by about 50 percent uh, since that, those early days. Uh, and we can see a, a path for continued reduction in the, in the uh, cost per tonne, which is why more and more uh, industry players are coming to the table. So you said that, you know, uh, several years ago, some players left uh, uh, abandoned CCUS because of cost. But what you actually see now are more and more players coming to the table. When we started the Quest project, uh, when the Stelmach government started it, 
um, there was, I don't believe there was one industrial scale CCUS project in the United States. There are now a dozen facilitated in part by the uh, 45Q investment tax credit. And uh, if we don't get on our, back on our game here, there will be dozens more in the United States and we'll get left behind on technology where we were pioneers. So you heard here today from some of the, the leading tech people in the industry just, uh, just how viable and, and essential this, this is. Now the, the Pathways Coalition of the major oil sands producers um, estimate broadly, broadly that uh, uh, perhaps half of the progress that they can make in achieving their net zero 2050 target would be through a CCUS uh, style technology. So that's not an exact measure, but that gives you a sense of the, the scale and the order of magnitude and how important this is. And Shailen, do you have a uh, follow-up today? I do, yes. Uh, switching gears, another question for the Premier, though. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a recent letter from your Education Minister to school authorities um, in regards to not requiring mandatory vaccines for students. I I'm just wondering, why would we not hold younger vaccine recipients to similar standards as the rest of the population, and, and should there not be any consequences for students not getting vaccinated? Well, uh, Alberta has never had a, a vaccine requirement to, uh, for students to go to school, uh, even though we've always encouraged uh, uh, parents to, to get their kids vaccinated with the uh, flu vaccine and other, other vaccines to protect their health. Um, and uh, the School Act, the Education Act, pardon me, is very clear uh, that uh, school boards have a legal obligation uh, to give access to children uh, to the classroom uh, regardless of their health status. Uh, we have uh, now very inclusive classrooms which uh, ha have expanded that sense of, of, uh, of access and equality of opportunity to learn for kids. And uh, if, if parents for one reason or another uh, choose not to have their children receive a COVID-19 vaccine, that should not be held against their kids and their chances of learning. Um, we do know, one thing we certainly know from the COVID uh, era is that children are set behind, set back uh, by online virtual learning, not just in terms of their learning, but their social development. Uh, there are, of course, uh, many safety protocols uh, to mitigate spread uh, in the schools, but let's re recall one thing. Uh, COVID-19 poses an extremely small risk to young children uh, for severe outcomes. Uh, we have not had a single fatal COVID-19 fatality in Alberta for anyone under the age of 18 after 20 months of this pandemic. Um, we, I think right now, have one person under the age of 18 uh, in ICU with COVID-19. Uh, the science is clear that the seasonal flu generally poses a greater risk for severe outcomes to younger children than does COVID-19. Um, we await the decision of Health Canada with respect to Pfizer's application for approval of their pediatric uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. We're encouraged that Health Canada is not rushing the process. They are not doing a, an emergency use uh, process, but rather a full and exhaustive review of the trials and all of the relative, relevant uh, science uh, before proceeding. I think that is important uh, given the, the extremely low risk of severe outcomes to younger children it's very important that they be certain about the safety of the vaccines uh, in, in, in weighing the balance of risks and benefits. Uh, if that uh, authorization is granted by Health Canada, um, and assuming that we receive advice from both the National and Alberta Advisory Committees on Immunization, we will certainly proceed with making the, uh, the vaccines available for uh, children between the ages of 6 and 11, and uh, we'll provide uh, accurate information to help inform the decisions of parents. Thanks, Premier. Operator, can you please connect our next call? Lisa Johnson, Edmonton Journal. Hi, thanks for taking my question. This is for the Premier or the House Leader Nixon, if he'd like to weigh in. Um, Minister Nixon, you spoke about the importance of getting to work for Albertans. Uh, so far, this, this legislature sitting, we've seen a lot of bills that don't have regulations written yet and don't take full effect until those regulations are written. I'm thinking about the electricity bill, housing bill, professional accreditation, recycling, bill related to teachers. Um, how should Albertans interpret this sitting so far? How should Albert Albertans interpret that? Well, I'll start and then invite uh, the House Leader to chip in here. Uh, 
first of all, Lisa, what you're describing is, is just ha the normal legislative process. Uh, legislation, statutory law passed by the legislature uh, is, uh, sets uh, broad legal parameters. Uh, the details are always filled in uh, by regulation, which, is, which are usually follow further consultation technical consultation. So this is, this is not anything new. It's the standard way by which every legislature in the Westminster system operates. Um, but uh, this is, I would just underscore how ambitious this agenda is. I mean, this government has already passed over 100 bills into law. We've already substantially implemented uh, around 85% of our election platform commitments. That was on the biggest platform in Alberta electoral history, and we continue to do so in this session. Uh, with a very Im important focus on uh, economic recovery. Uh, so, for example, the, uh, as you mentioned, the electricity bill introduced by uh, Minister Nally, uh, hugely important to pursue innovation in Alberta's electricity sector. Uh, for example, we think coming out of that empowerment of, uh, for uh, self-generation could be a huge new industry of um, data mining and processing, cryptocurrency mining and proce processing, moving that investment in jobs from places like China uh, to, to this province. And, and uh, a lot of other bills very focused on the economy. With that, I'll invite the House Leader to speak. Uh, thanks, Dr. Premier. And Lisa, as the, as the Premier said, this is a standard process. I have seen uh, some stuff from the official opposition in the, uh, in the last few days indicating that they would like to see regulations happen simultaneously with legislation. I will note that the entire four years that they were in government, I never saw that happen. And the reason for that is you've got to pass laws and bills to be able to create a framework that you could then do regulations. So regulations are uh, the following step. And this is the same way that would take place in the House of Commons. Any legislature in the country uh, that I am aware of, of course, the legislature has to make a decision on the legal frameworks. Uh, and then we get to work on putting together a regulatory framework. As for how Albertans should feel about this session, I think they should be uh, happy to see that Alberta's government continues to be laser focused on making sure that they pass legislation that helps uh, Albertans uh, in their everyday lives, as well as continues to move forward our economy and help with Alberta's recovery. And you, and you mentioned uh, the recycling legislation. And yes, you'll see the regulations come uh, in the coming months. They'll be finished by 2022. Uh, this is legislation that has been asked for by the industry for decades, uh, and this government's moving forward. It was a key component of the Dow announcement in recent weeks, which is billi bringing billions of dollars to our economy and thousands of jobs immediately. And that's just one example of legislation uh, that's being passed that, uh, through that type of a process. So you'll see the regulations come just as fast uh, as you've seen the legislative process take place. As the Premier just mentioned, uh, this government has passed well over 100 bills in just over two years. Uh, that's more than any government in Alberta history, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and we'll continue to do everything we can with the legislature to make sure that we can help Alberta's recovery. Thanks, Minister. And Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Sure. This is an unrelated follow-up, just because uh, I want to get ahead of the UCP AGM tomorrow. Um, I'm wondering if you can confirm whether or not there is a memo from the Premier's staff instructing other political staff in the building on how to rank convention resolutions, and if so, what does that mean for a party that's built itself up as a, a grassroots movement? No, I, I can't confirm. I haven't seen such a memo. All I'll say is it's hardly surprising that um, political staff on their personal time are involved in political matters, that, that just as MLAs and, and ministers are. And uh, so I would be, I think it would be entirely normal to have uh, political staff attending, participating in, in a convention. Um, so uh, looking forward to getting together with, uh, I believe, over a thousand uh, members of the party. For the first time we've been able to during the COVID period and getting reconnected in a COVID safe way uh, and beginning to chart the course uh, forward for the future. I think we have a lot to take stock of and to celebrate with a, a government that has kept uh, around 85 percent of our election commitments with another 18 months to go to get closer to 100 uh, it, percent. It'll, it'll be an opportunity to celebrate Alberta's uh, leading Canada uh, by a country mile in economic growth and recovery, uh, job creation, diversification, uh, making life better for Albertans and, and also to celebrate the steps we've made uh, to fight for a fair deal for the province, including the recent uh, referendum on equalization. You know, uh, a lot of what informed our platform came off the floor of uh, United Conservative uh, Party annual general meeting debates on the floor. Resolutions uh, conceived of by grassroots members that went through an exhaustive process 
ended up becoming party policy and then found their way into the platform and have now become the law of the land. You know, I'll give you two examples, the commitment to citizens initiated referendum and this commitment to recall, uh, powerfully important democratic reforms uh, that came up through the grassroots membership and are now the law. So looking forward to a, a good and healthy debate on, uh, on these and other issues. Thanks, Premier. We have time for three more calls today. Operator, can you please connect our next call? James Keller, Globe and Mail. Hi, a question for the Premier. I want to ask you about uh, Trans Mountain uh, and the, with the rail lines out um, and so the inability to transport uh, oil to the West Coast. How much of a problem is that for the industry, for the province's finances, uh, that we essentially have this situation where kind of indefinitely uh, we don't know when this stuff will be back online. Th thank you uh, for the important question, James. Uh, before answering, I just wanted to uh, once again express uh, our solidarity and uh, support for our neighbors, friends and family uh, next door in British Columbia. Uh, it's, um, I think, moving for all of us to see the adversity that they are facing, uh, the farms and homes and businesses that are underwater, the uh, uh, inf damage to infrastructure, and we're all concerned about the implications for uh, the, con the, con excuse me, the country's economy functioning because we rely so much on uh, trade coming out of uh, the Pacific through British Columbia. So yesterday I did speak uh, yet again to Premier Horgan. We had spoken on uh, calls with other Premiers on Monday and Tuesday. He and I had a, a bilateral conversation yesterday um, where I once again expressed uh, our willingness, our eagerness to help BC in any practical way. Uh, the Premier did flag a couple of things where we, our Ministers of Agriculture are cooperating. Uh, one is uh, with, because BC's veterinary lab in Abbotsford is completely underwater um, and uh, men, men, much of the livestock uh, in the Fraser Valley has been displaced uh, or, or damaged and so the, those veterinary services are very important. So we're working together with Manitoba, I understand, on offering uh, backup veterinary um, laboratory services. He also uh, said we, he looked for help with respect to uh, silage because their feedstocks have been destroyed by the flood in the valley. Um, and uh, we're looking at what we can do, although, as you know, we've been under, um, uh, because of uh, dry weather this past year, our, our, our uh, livestock producers themselves have been facing a, a severe shortage of, of silage. So we're, we'll see if we can do anything on that. I indicated anything else we'd, we could help on, we're, we're uh, standing at the ready. With respect to uh, Trans Mountain, um, my understanding is that the pipeline has been suspended not because of damage to the infrastructure, so not because of any imminent danger, but as a precautionary measure. Um, and uh, we, uh, we hope that they will be, uh, feel confident to renew service, uh, restore service uh, shortly, because we know that uh, as um, uh, this is the lower mainland in particular is is dependent overwhelmingly on the oil that is delivered by the Trans Mountain pipeline uh, to fuel the lower mainland economy. Uh, they're obviously going to be drawing down on on storage, and I uh, suppose trying to bring in uh, imports from the refineries uh, in the Seattle area in in Washington State. Um, but um, if, there's, if there's anything we can do in cooperation with, uh, with the, uh, Trans Mountain, we will be there. But uh, our understanding is this was a temporary suspension uh, in an excess of caution uh, given the, uh, the situation. Uh, so there you are. Thanks, Premier. Operator, uh, can you please put through James Keller again to have a follow-up question? Yeah, a quick follow-up. I mean, if this goes on for more than a few days, you know, with transportation kind of knocked out, and particularly on the rail side as well, what does that do to our takeaway capacity and some of the problems that we've seen over the last couple of years? And I'd be interested if uh, Simon Younger could also address this uh, from Imperial Oil's sure. perspective. Well, I, I, I don't – look, I am kind of hesitate to talk about – uh, the impact to Alberta's oil industry when we're our primary concern right now is for the safety of, of our uh, British Columbia friends and family. That's our primary focus. But obviously, um, the damage and the, and the suspension of this uh, of Trans Mountain do, will have a very real knock on effect in terms of economy, the economy, um, access to fuel, critical. Um, I, I mean, obviously, a, a TMX, uh, sorry, Trans Mountain proper. Uh, it, it, with uh, roughly half a million barrels a day of shipments is, is a, a very important part of Alberta's economy. 
And because some of that is exported, it, it does help uh, to reduce our, our differential a bit. Um, but um, uh, we are hopeful that they'll be able to restore service soon and, and bring uh, the market back into balance down there. Simon, do you have any in input into that? Thank you, Premier. I'm really going to agree with Premier's messages. To be honest, it's, it's really far too early to speculate on some of the uh, sort of impacts you've mentioned. And from our perspective, certainly uh, our, our focus is on the, uh, the people, the communities, the families that are, that are impacted by this devastating event. And uh, really, that's our primary focus at the moment. You know, from our perspective, we are working closely with, with suppliers, with customers, and, and probably most importantly, some of the transportation companies that are uh, responsible for delivering our products. Uh, and we're monitoring that very, very closely, and we're doing all that we can to, uh, to ease that situation as, as much as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Sorry about that, James. Uh, operator, now can you please put through our next call? Tom um, Vernon, Global News. Hi, Premier. Thanks for taking my call. I, I want to ask about the announcement today in this funding. Uh, 131 million today, more than 100 million a couple weeks ago. What kind of performance requirements are is put on this funding, um, are, are they required to meet the specs that are being mentioned during the announcement? What happens if they don't meet those specs? Well, the, today's announcement is anticipated to create over 3 million uh, tons in reduction. La two weeks ago, the announcement you are referring to, Tom, is uh, another 7 million tons. Uh, we do know that uh, since the ERA, or Emissions Reductions Alberta, started this work with Alberta Environment and Parks, we've seen over 40 million tonnes uh, by 2030 being reduced uh, for our, from our economy because of the technology that's created. Uh, there is a robust process that takes place between Alberta Environment and Parks, Alberta Energy, uh, Alberta Jobs and Economy, Alberta Innovates and Emissions Reductions Alberta that includes many, many experts uh, that work to be able to figure out which of these projects that should be selected based on two criteria. One is the environmental outcome, uh, both for the immediate project but potentials uh, across the industry long term, uh, and the total obviously emissions that could be reduced from that process, as well as jobs that will be created and the opportunity to be able to make sure that we can continue forward uh, creating jobs with our, our largest industries inside this province. Uh, when you're dealing with new technologies, there's no guarantee on, uh, on, on every project, uh, but what you can do is go back and focus on the record of emissions reductions Alberta and Alberta Environment and Parks as they've used technology innovation emission reduction program money and the programs that came before uh, TIER was uh, brought into place by this government uh, and the emission reductions that come from that speak for itself. So uh, obviously uh, we're very comfortable with the process and the fact that most of the time they're hitting uh, home runs uh, and occasionally you hit a dud but if you don't swing at every ball uh, you're not going to be able to eventually be able to innovate our way out of uh, this challenging circumstances that we find ourselves in on GHG emissions. Thanks Minister. Tom, do you have a follow-up today? I don't. My follow-up was already asked. Thank you. Great. Operator, can you please connect our last call of the day? Tim Birch, CTV News. Hi, thanks. Uh, this one's for the Premier. I, I just want to go back to this uh, vaccination for 5 to 11 or 6 to 11. Um, other jurisdictions, uh, I'm thinking of Manitoba and Ontario, have already laid out detailed plans about how exactly this rollout's going to work, how kids are going to get vaccines, where and when that's going to happen. Uh, why hasn't Alberta come forward with its own plan yet? Well, the health ministry has been working on that uh, for uh, months now, and uh, they'll be releasing the details shortly. We've been, of course, uh, waiting for Health Canada uh, approval. Uh, you know, I, I think our focus is on making sure that parents are confident about the safety and efficacy of the pediatric vaccine. And so rushing this or getting ahead of the regulation, getting ahead of Health Canada approval, I don't think would help us to instill that sense of confidence. Um, we've done some public opinion research indicating that roughly half of parents of ch children in that age range uh, are, are likely to get their kids vaccinated. So it's a much lower level of um, support for vaccination in, uh, for amongst parents for kids of that age than there is in the adult population. And, and I, I think that is a reflection of the very low risk that COVID-19 poses to younger children, but also a desire on the par part of parents to make sure that the vaccine is safe. So our main focus right now is on that safety issue. That's why we are uh, waiting for uh, Health Canada's uh, decision. We're not getting ahead of them. We're not rushing this. We want to be careful and deliberate about this, but if and when 
authorization is received and we get the scientific uh, advice to proceed, uh, we will be rolling out a very ambitious program. I can tell you, we've already made the basic decisions about how to do so uh, as quickly as possible. We would expect uh, very rapid demand in the first, um, you know, two or three weeks. Uh, because there are some parents, of course, very uh, understandably keen to get their kids vaccinated. So we'll be there to try to get to provide maximum uh, supply right early in the first phase of the vaccination. And I think it will then uh, likely uh, to tail off given the, the higher level of um, hesitancy amongst parents that we've seen in the polling. And Tim, did you have a follow up to finish things off today? Yeah, I, I mean, we've we've spent the last you know, six months, I guess, all of summer and all of autumn saying vaccines are so important, everyone should get them, safety is high, there's no reason not to be vaccinated as an adult. So don't you think, you know, answers like you just gave, answers that you gave a couple minutes ago comparing, uh, you know, seasonal flu numbers to COVID numbers in kids, don't you think it's a little dangerous for your government to be giving that messaging, maybe a little bit hypocritical? Don't you want every everyone who's eligible to be vaccinated to be vaccinated? I don't think it's ever dangerous or hypocritical to share basic scientific facts about this disease. Uh, it is a, a simple reality uh, that uh, COVID-19 poses a risk of severe outcomes, for example, to people over the age of uh, 70. That's about 1,000 times greater than the risk posed to children under the age of 12. That's not to say there is zero risk for kids, but it is to say, recognize that parents are going to want to know that on the balance, uh, the protection offered by the vaccine um, uh, outweighs any potential risk. And I can understand parents wanting to have that information. Uh, they, I don't think parents want spin. They don't want politics. They don't want pressure. They want clear, objective, scientific data. They want a rigorous approval process that assures them of the safety of this. And indeed, if that approval comes forward from Health Canada, and if it's uh, ratified by the advisory committees on immunization, absolutely will encourage uh, parents to have their uh, six to 12, six to 11 year old children vaccinated. Uh, doing so will be helpful for the uh, limita overall limitation of spread in the population. It will be particularly important, should it be approved, uh, for children with serious chronic health conditions. Uh, and so we'll be providing all of that information to par for parents to make informed choices uh, but, to, but to be respectful uh, of the decisions that they make for their young children. And, and I just think it's incumbent upon us to be dispassionate and objective in the information that we share about that. Thanks, Premier. That wraps things up for today. Thank you, everyone.